Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. Today we're going to continue our examination of young earth creationism by looking at chapter three of the world upside down. This chapter is actually divided into three separate parts. And the second and third parts are the Tower of Babel and an examination of space in relationship to the firmament. But the first part will be the flood of Noah, and that's what we're going to address today. Now, before we do that, we need to follow up on our last episode. I put a little test up for you. Now, last episode, I rather whimsically suggested that since the first heaven was the sky, the second heaven was the firmament, and the third heaven was the waters above where God lived, I suggested that perhaps God was a fish, and if we had been created in his image, we would have lived in the ocean and had gills. Then I brought up this photograph of embryos, and I asked you which one was human. Now, I've got a lot of very good answers on that, but I think I'll go ahead and give you the answer right now that I have. So let's have a look. Now, if your German's a little bit rusty, on the left is fish, then turtle, then salamander, then bird, and the pair top and bottom on the right is human. I suspect that they probably have turtle and salamander switched because I see external gills in the bottom embryo, second from the left. But the important thing is that all of these embryos have a similar form and they all have gill slits. You can see an awful lot of evolution and common ancestry in embryology. So let's cue up the music and learn a little bit about Noah's Ark. Approximately 1,600 years after God created the earth, the number of men and women had multiplied greatly. Unfortunately, however, mankind had become exceedingly wicked. Genesis 6 verse 5 says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Consequently, God decided to destroy the vast majority of mankind, saving just a handful of people. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. In order to destroy mankind, God decided to use the means of a worldwide flood. Genesis 6 verse 17 says, And behold, I, even I, do bring a flood of waters upon the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life from under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. All right, so we have a couple of things that I'd like to address in this opening statement that he makes. First of all, one of the things that are, is very common when people undergo some sort of an adverse event or a disaster is to say, what did I do to deserve this? It's very common to look at natural phenomena, the eruption of a volcano, a flood, a fire, and try and reflect the blame for that inwardly. So this goes right along with that. The earth was destroyed because man was wicked. But that brings up the second problem that we're running into. What did the birds and the fowl and the fish of the sea do to deserve destruction? If it was man that caused the problem, wouldn't the punishment be directed towards men? Why involve the animals? Now, something that we're going to address in a few minutes is that there is good evidence that a flood actually occurred. But was it supernatural or was it natural? We'll see in a bit. If you remember from Genesis chapter 1, the purpose of the firmament was to divide the waters above it from the waters that were below it. So what God did was God opened windows in the firmament, allowing the water which was above it to flow down into the earth. Genesis 7 verse 11 says, In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. We know that this heaven is referring to the firmament 
because you can't make windows in an open space. You can only make windows in something solid, such as a wall. Well, that's an interesting assertion. Sort of a window into your mind, so to say. Now, the other thing that I have a problem with here is it talks about Noah being 600 years old. That's not possible for a human being. Our bodies break down centuries before that. The oldest human being ever recorded, to my knowledge, is not much older than 120 years old. Another thing that kind of bothers me is they have a very specific date here, to a day. Now, if this was roughly 1,600 years after creation, we could actually look at when Jesus was born, for example, and backdate it and find an exact date of the flood. Then we could compare it to historical records from that time. And there are historical records, uh, such as cave paintings, going back 15,000 years or more. So we do have pretty good dates that we can compare this to. But let's go ahead and continue. Eventually, so much of this water poured down through the firmament that even the mountains were submerged. Genesis 7, verse 19 and 20 say, And the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth, and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. Fifteen cubits upward did the waters prevail, and the mountains were covered. A good way to picture it is this. Imagine drilling holes in the top of a snow globe and filling it with water. That is what God did to the earth. Now here's another inconvenient observation. If you drill holes in the top of a snow globe and submerge it under water, water will go into the snow globe, but bubbles will come out. Where did the bubbles go? Can we still observe these bubbles? Is there any evidence that there are bubbles in the third heaven? Inquiring minds want to know. The flood would have been impossible on a spherical earth because you cannot flood a ball, much less a ball spinning at 66,000 miles per hour. Centripetal force would have flung the waters into every direction. Now one of the holes that I find in both flat earth and young earth creationism is their inability to properly use scientific terms and concepts. So for example, in this video, he talks about centrifugal force on a spinning ball flinging water off the surface. Now he throws out a huge number, 67,000 miles an hour. I have no idea where he's getting this from in relationship to the rotation speed of the Earth. The Earth itself rotates about 1,038 miles an hour at the equator, and it's slower north or south of the equator. And we're talking linear speed there. The angular rotation of the Earth is about 15 degrees per hour because it makes a 360 degree circle every 24 hours. What is the centrifugal force at the equator? Well, it's about a third of a percent of the force of gravity. In order for things to be weightless at the equator, the Earth would have to rotate every 84 minutes, and this is easily calculable. That's why objects in orbit around the Earth, like the International Space Station, orbit the Earth once every 92 minutes. They're a little further up from the surface, about 400 kilometers, and that drops the orbital speed from about 84 minutes at the surface to about 92 minutes, 400 kilometers above the surface. This is all simple math. Yet the people that put these assertions out that if the Earth was rotating, the water would fly off of it are assuming that the people watching this video either won't do the math or can't do the math to determine whether or not that is a correct statement. It is not a correct statement. After God had successfully wiped out the majority of mankind, God closed the windows in the firmament, causing the water flow to cease. Genesis 8 verse 2 says, The fountains also of the deep and the windows of heaven were stopped. Notice that in this verse, the windows of heaven and the rain are identified as two separate things. Please notice in this verse as well that the flood was caused by opening the windows of the firmament and allowing the waters above to come down. So if the windows of the firmament are open, 
water would be coming through them from the waters above. This is not the only time that the firmament is mentioned being opened in the Bible. First, the firmament was opened at Jesus' baptism. Now, less than a minute ago, didn't he say that when the heavens were opened, the floods came down? If the heavens were opened a second time, there should have been a second flood if the first story was correct. Second, the firmament was opened at the stoning of Stephen. And once again, there's that whole thing, heaven opened up and we didn't have a flood. Third, the firmament was opened in the Apostle John's vision while on the island of Patmos. Oh, and once again, when the doors of the firmament were open, a flood did not result. And fourth, the firmament opens right before the battle of Armageddon. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Notice that in this verse, after the firmament opens, Jesus comes down through it on a white horse. Now again, if the firmament was opened, exposing the sky to the waters above, I would think there would be a huge rush of water. So rather than a horse, perhaps Jesus was riding a board and had a bushy, bushy blonde hairdo. Cowabunga! So here we learn that above the firmament is God's throne. This is why the Bible says in Isaiah 40, verse 22, It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers, that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain, and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. According to this verse, God has stretched out the firmament as a tent for the world to dwell in, and he is sitting on top of that tent, and when he looks down from that vantage point, we all look like grasshoppers. In addition, notice that the Bible says that God is sitting upon the circle of the earth and not the sphere. This is because the earth is shaped as a circle. A circle is a two-dimensional object, and a sphere is a three-dimensional object. Now, I think it's kind of important to make note of a geometric fact here. This is a disk. It's also a circle. Now, the difference between a circle and a sphere is if you move the circle, it becomes an ellipse, or if you look at it from a different angle. Whereas with a sphere, no matter how you move it, it's always a circle from above. Just wanted to clear that up. Now, let's take a few minutes and actually look at what the flood of Noah could have been. We'll have a look at the historical record. We'll have a look at some of the mythology and the oral traditions of early civilizations and see what science has to say about it. Now, despite having a rather hard look at the descriptions of the flood of Noah and the firmament in this presentation, there are actually many civilizations that have tales of a worldwide flood. Noah's flood seems to have come from the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is one of many cross-cultural flood myths. Here's one from the Ojibwas here in Michigan. And in this story, there was a great flood and everybody died except for one old man in a canoe who paddled around picking up animals from the water and putting them in his canoe. Again, very similar to what we hear with Noah's story. Now, this came from a book in 1905 of Native American myths and folklore. And the Native Americans had been exposed to Christian missionaries for a couple of hundred years by that time, and there may have been some cross-cultural dissemination of this flood story, but that doesn't explain all of the flood stories in ancient history. Now, surprisingly, science says there was a flood, and it was not a supernatural flood. It was a natural flood at the end of the last ice age. Now, I'm going to actually have a Friday science on this, so I'm going to go over it rather briefly. But at the end of the Ice Age, approximately 10,000 years ago, there were huge glaciers that extended from the poles towards the equator from both the North and the South Poles. Now, as these broke up and melted, a huge amount of water was released. And this did two things. The first is that fresh water went into the sea. Now, as a matter of fact, we can actually measure the ocean levels and mean sea level back thousands of years 
And as you can see, at about 16,000 years ago, the sea level was really quite low, and then there was a rapid increase in sea level going to about eight to 10,000 years ago, and it seemed to have stabilized about 8,000 years ago. Now, this causes two things. First of all, as the seas fill up, there are valleys along the shore and areas of low land where the sea can actually overflow its basin and go inland. Now, if that sea goes inland and finds a depression or an inland lake, such as what the Black Sea started off as, it can flood that. And what happened in that case was a flood channel came through the Bosphorus Straits by Istanbul and literally inundated the entire Black Sea area. The water came in so fast that the level of the Black Sea rose about a foot a day and inundated uh, an additional half to one mile of shoreline on a daily basis. There were people living in that area at the time. Now, people left the area after the flood, obviously, and resettled in other areas and brought with them their oral traditions and oral histories of this flood. That may have been the basis for the Epic of Gilgamesh, these oral histories of people that actually experienced this flood. Now, a second way that you can get massive and sudden flooding of an area is due to glacial lakes of meltwater. Now, many times these glacial lakes go through valleys and they're plugged at one end of the valley by what they call an ice dam, which is basically a finger of the glacier that cuts off the water that's in these glacial lakes from getting into the sea. These ice dams do break down, and when they break down, you can get a huge inundation downstream, much like a dam bursting. Now, Lake Missoula is a classic example of this out in Eastern Oregon. Now, when that occurs, what happens is you get these enormous flows of water going down valleys and they leave gravel bars and waves in the gravel, much like you'd see in the bottom of a river or the bottom of a lake. And you can actually see these to this day if you look at the landscape where these floods were. This is from central Russia. This is also how you get smooth river stones and gravel on the tops of mountains. It's from these floods. Now, I'm going to have a full Friday science episode on these glacial floods and rising sea levels and the effects of the end of the last ice age on topography. So hopefully you can tune in for that, and I think you'll find it interesting. But in the meantime, this is Bob the Science Guy signing out from northern Michigan. Next episode will be on the Tower of Babel, followed by space exploration and the firmament. Keep up in your stocks of gopher wood and keep the silt out of your gills. Take care, guys.